unlike a newspaper article or or a, a Instagram post, with a paper, you're not necessarily going to get it the first time. You certainly won't get everything. So that I, I think spending some time with papers for me means reading it and then reading it again a little bit later. Or you and, know, and tell me what? At a time. Yeah, I was yeah. just about to say, what's your because because I kind of have a way that I do it, but I'm curious as to how you do it. Like if you're if you're encountering a paper for the first time, what do you have an order in which you like to go through the? Do you, do you want do you read it sequentially or do you look at the figures first? I mean, how do you how do you go through it? Yeah, unless it's an area that I know very very well where I can you know, skip to some things um, before reading it the whole way through. Um, my process is always the same. And actually, this is fun because I used to teach a class when I was a professor at UC San Diego um, called Neural Circuits in Health and Disease. And it was an evening course that grew very quickly from 50 students to 400 plus students. And we would do exactly this. We would mm. parse papers. And, um, and I had everyone ask what I called the four questions. Um, mm. And it wasn't exactly four questions, but I have a a little three by five card next to me or a piece of a main nap by 11 paper typically. And when I sit down with a paper, I want to figure out what is the question they're asking? Mm. What's the general question? What's the specific question? And I write down the question. Mm. Then what was the approach? You know, how did they test that question? And sometimes that can get a bit detailed. You can get into immunohistochemistry and they did a, you know, PCR for this. It's not so important uh, for most people that they understand every method, but it is worthwhile that if you encounter a method like PCR or, um, you know, chromatography or fMRI, that you at least look up on the internet what its purpose is. Okay, that will help a lot. And then it was what they found. And there, um, you can usually figure out what they believe they found anyway, by reading the figure headers, right? What are, you know, figure one, here's the header that typically, if it's an experimental paper, it will tell you what they want you to think they found. Mm. And then I, tend to want to know the conclusion of the study. And then this is really the key one. And this is the one that um, would really distinguish the high performing students from the others. You have to go back at the end and ask whether or not the conclusions, the major conclusions drawn in the paper are really substantiated by what they found and what they did. And that involves some thinking. It involves really, you know, spending some time thinking about what, what they identified. Now, this isn't something that anyone can do straight off the bat. It's a skill that you develop over time and different papers require different formats. But those four questions really form the cornerstone of, a, of teaching undergraduates and I think graduate students as well of how to read a paper. And um, again, it's something that can be cultivated um, and it's still how I approach papers. So what I do typically is I'll read title abstract. I s usually then will skip to the figures and see how much of it I can digest without reading the text and then go back and read the text. But in fairness, journals, great journals like Science, like Nature, oftentimes will pack so much information, in the cell press journals too, into each figure. And it's coded with no definition of the acronyms that almost always I'm into the introduction and results within a couple of minutes wondering what the hell this acronym is or that acronym is. And it's, um, it's just, yeah, it's just wild how much... Um, how much nomenclature there really is. I can't remember, was it you or was it our friend Paul Conti when he was here um, who said that, oh no, I'm sorry, it was neither. It was chair of ophthalmology at Stanford, uh, Dr. Jeffrey Goldberg, who was a guest on the podcast recently, who off camera, I think it was, told us that if you look at the total number of words and terms that a physician leaving medical school owns in their mind and their vocabulary, it's the equivalent of like two additional full languages of fluency beyond their native language. So you're yep. trilingual at least. I don't know, do you speak a language other than English? Poorly. Okay, so you're you're, you're, you're at least trilingual and probably more. So no one is expected to be able to parse these papers the first time through without, you know, substantial training. Yeah, no, I, I, I think that's a, that's a great format. And you're absolutely right. I have a different way that I do it when I'm familiar with the subject matter versus yeah, when I'm it? not. Uh, well, again, if I'm reading papers that are something that I know really well, I can basically glean everything I need to know from the figures. Um, and then sometimes I'll just do a quick skim on methods. Um, but I don't need to read the discussion. I don't need to read the intro. I don't need to read anything else. Uh, if it's something that I know less about, then I usually do exactly what you say. I try to start with the figures. I usually end up generating more questions like, what what, what do you mean? What, it, how, what is this? How did they do that? Uh, and then I got to go back and read methods typically. 
And one of the other things that's probably worth mentioning is a lot of papers these days have supplemental information that are not attached to the paper. So um, you're amazed at how much stuff gets put in the supplemental section. And the reason for that, of course, is that the journals are very uh, specific on the format and length of a paper. So a lot of the times when you're submitting something, you know, like if you want to put any additional information in there, it can't go in the main article. It has to go in the supplemental figure. So even for this paper, there were a couple of the numbers I spouted off that I had to pull out of the supplemental paper. For example, when they did the sensitivity analysis on the um, censoring versus non-censoring, that, that was in the supplemental figure. That was actually not even in the paper we presented.